Hey, uh, Alex here for chapter 10, fixed assets and intangible assets. Okay, so this is the introduction. Do you remember purchasing your first car? You probably didn't buy your first car like you'd buy a CD. Purchasing a new or used car is expensive. In addition, you would drive, use the car for the next three or five years longer. As a result, you might spend hours or weeks considering different makes and models, safety ratings, warranties, and operating costs before deciding on the final purchase. Like buying her first car, Lovi Yancey spent a lot of time before deciding to open her first restaurant. In 1952, she created the biggest, juiciest hamburger that anyone had ever seen. She called it a fat burger. The restaurant initially started as a 24-hour operation to cater to the schedules of professional musicians. As a fan of popular music and its performers, Yancey played rhythm and blues, jazz, and blues recordings for her customers. Fat Burger's popularity with entertainers was illustrated when its name was used in a 1992 rap by Ice T, Ice Cube, two in the morning, got the Fat Burger, Cube said, in It Was a Good Day, a track on his Predator album. Pretty neat. The demand for his incredible burger was such that in 1980, Miss Yancey decided to offer Fat Burger franchise opportunities. In 1990, with the goal of expanding Fat Burger throughout the world, Fat Burger Incorporated purchased the business from Miss Yancey. Today, Fat Burger has grown to a multi restaurant chain with owners and investors, such as talk show host Montel Williams, former Cincinnati Bengals tackle Willie Anderson, comedian David Spade, and musicians Cher, Janet Jackson, and Pharrell. So how much would it cost you to open a fat burger restaurant? On average, the total investment begins at over $700,000 per restaurant. Thus, in starting a fat burger restaurant, um, you'd be making a significant investment that would affect your life for years to come. This chapter discusses the accounting for investments in fixed assets such as those used to open a fat burger restaurant, how to determine the portion of fixed assets that becomes an expense over time is also discussed. Finally, the accounting for the disposal of fixed assets and accounting for intangible assets such as patents and copyrights are discussed. All right, so the nature of fixed assets. Fixed assets are long-term or relatively permanent assets such as equipment, machinery, buildings, and land. There's three, there's three big characteristics of fixed assets. They exist physically and thus are tangible assets. They are owned and used by the company in its normal operations. They are not offered for sale as part of normal operations. So the, it's not like they have the assets just to resell them. It's for making more money. Classifying costs. A cost that has been incurred may be classified as a fixed asset, an investment, or an expense. So, if it's going to, uh, here's a, how you can determine this. Is, uh, is the purchase ass item long lived? If yes, it's an asset on the balance sheet, either as a fixed or investment. Proceed to step two. If no, it's an expense. If the, is the asset used in normal operations? If yes, the asset is classified and recorded as a fixed asset. If no, the asset is classified and recorded as an investment. So if the asset isn't used as normal, as a normal day-to-day -day operation, so normally you're using it to make your money. If it's not normally used as a, the source of your revenue, it's an investment. Investment is where you invest in something else that hopefully gives you return. So businesses can also invest. That's, that's important to, to acknowledge. That's how businesses can, we'll get into this later, businesses can buy shares of another business and actually own the majority of the business. So business can own another business and influence them. It's pretty neat. All right, so um, there's the cost of fixed assets. Um, 
Now, there's a difference between capital and revenue expenditures. Costs that benefit only the current period are called revenue expenditures. Costs that improve the asset or extend its useful life are capital expenditures. So ordinary maintenance and repairs like oil changes, uh, tire rotations, tune-ups, you expense that. It's not increasing the asset. It's just something you have to do. So you debit repairs and maintenance expense for, let's say, 200 and you credit cash for 200 Asset improvements. So let's say you add an hydraulic lift to your truck and it costs $5,000. You've improved the asset because now it can lift heavier loads. It becomes more efficient, quicker loading. So you debit delivery truck for 5000 credit cash for 5000 You've increased the asset. You see the difference? And extraordinary repairs are when you extend the life of an asset. So let's say we have a forklift here. You overhauled the engine for $4,000. So, so you didn't improve the asset. You didn't just do maintenance. You actually increased the life. So you're going to debit accumulated depreci depreciation for $4,000, credit cash for $4,000. So you've extended the life of the asset. So there's three ways to expense things. Um, well, there are two ways, revenue expenditure, capital, but there's three different entries you can make, depending on if it's just a maintenance and repair, an asset improvement, or an extraordinary repair. Okay, um, accounting for depreciation. This periodic recording of the cost of fixed assets as an expense is called depreciation. Depreciation, the reason you do it is because instead of expensing an asset all at once and spiking your expense for the year or for the month, you can have an, an asset and write it off little by little throughout the whole life of the, the asset, so three to five years, whatever it is. So it doesn't increase your expenses so much that it would inaccurately affect the financial statements. Um, the straight line method, okay, there's three methods that are mainly used. There's a straight line method. The straight line method provides for the same amount of depreciation expense for each year of the asset's useful life. Units of production method. The units of production method provides the same amount of depreciation expense for each unit of production. And the double declining method provides for declining period expense over the expected useful life of the asset. So a straight line is you take the cost of the asset minus the residual value divided by the useful life, 15 years, whatever it is, gives you the annual depreciation that doesn't change each year. It's the same each year. Units of production, you take the cost minus the residual value divided by the total units of production and that will give you the depreciation per unit so here's an example uh, we uh, we have equipment that has 10,000 operating hours so we take the 24,000 minus the 2,000 residual divided by the 10,000 hours equals a two dollar and twenty cent per hour rate so for every hour we run that machine we're depreciating it by $2.20. And that's another way to do it. That's a great depreciation method. And double declining can be sometimes difficult. The easiest that I recommend is you take you take the cost. Don't minus any any salvage. That's at the end. Times um, whatever uh, times, uh, let's say it's a three-year life, you, you would times the $10,000, let's say, asset, times two-thirds. Because if it's three years, straight line, here's a, here's a quick way to remember double decline. It's double whatever straight line is. So if, if straight line has a three-year or a five-year, if it's a five-year, you take a 10,000 times two divided by five equals the depreciation for the year. Or if it's three-year, two divided by three equals, and then you take that depreciation minus it from the cost, and then... What if you have left times it again by the two thirds, or the, or whatever you, uh, how many years you have, gives you the next depreciation. You keep doing that, whittling it down until all you leave is the salvage in there.
So that's all you'd leave. Okay, and the book value is the cost minus accumulated depreciation. So the book value declines, and thus also depreciation declines. So the book value is just the cost minus depreciation. That's the book value. Um, and, oh, when you, um, okay, natural resources. The process of transferring the cost of natural resources to an expense account is called depletion. So usually for mines, it's, it's an example. So if you have the cost of buying the mine, let's say it was 400000 and you it's estimated the engineer, he told you you're going to get about a million tons of ore. And you estimate, and you actually find out that you mined 90,000 per year. So this year you mined 90,000. So you take the cost of 400,000 divided by the million that the engineer said gives you 40 cents per ton. So every time you take a ton out of that mine, you're going to depreciate the mine by 40 cents a ton. So that you know exactly how much you're used up the, of the asset. So you know when does you when, so then you know when to sell the asset. Okay, here's the most important part of this. My favorite part of this chapter is intangible assets. These assets are called intangible assets because they do not exist physically. So, may, uh, the hardest part of accounting for this is determining initial cost and determining the amortization, which is the amount of cost to transfer to expense. So, an example of an intangible asset is education. So any of you out there that are on the fence about going to school, oh, it costs so much, oh, dang, I wish it didn't. Think about it this way. Every, all the money you spend on an education, it never depreciates. Education is intangible assets. So the money you pay to get educated, you can put it on your personal books and capitalize all the costs that you acquired to get that education. Because education doesn't deteriorate. What, what you've learned can't be taken from you. So education is a smart investment no matter what. And what you gain from it, you can use for anything else in life. It just helps you. Okay, so there's, here's some of the uh, patents. Manufacturers may acquire exclusive rights to produce and sell goods with one or more unique features. Such rights are granted by patents, which the federal government issues to inventors. Normally, they continue, you normally um, these rights continue for 20 years. So, of course you would take the cost of the asset divided by 20 years and that's how much you would amortize the patent at. Copyrights and trademarks. The exclusive right to copy, the exclusive right to publish and sell a literary, artistic, or musical composition is granted by a copyright. Copyrights are issued by the federal government and extend for 70 years beyond the author's death. That's one way. And the trademark is a name, term, or symbol used to identify a business and its products. Most businesses identify their trademarks with the little R with the circle or in it, around it. So there's an R with a circle around it. And their advertisements are on their products. So that's a trademark. Uh, I guess trademarks last for 10 years and you can renew them in 10 year periods. And then copyrights last 70 years after the author's death. So that's why like Edgar Allan Poe, you can actually uh, copyright, you can actually use his material because he's been dead for more than 70 years. Copyrights worn off. Okay, and goodwill. Goodwill refers to an intangible asset of a business that is created from such favorable, favorable factors as location, product, quality, reputation, and managerial skill. Goodwill also allows a business to earn a greater rate of return than normal. So goodwill is normally the purchase price of a business over its actual assets. So if you buy a business for 250000 but on the books it only had assets worth 200000 that extra 50000 you paid was actually going towards goodwill. You can put it, capitalize 50000 as goodwill. Probably because of the location of the business, the clientele that's attached to it, um, the, good, the good name, the good reviews. So that's goodwill. And, of course, uh, financial analysis and interpretation, uh, fixed asset turnover ratio. I always throw these ratios in just because normally uh, when you're taking accounting, 
you'll have a chapter, you'll have a part of class where you'll just do all ratios, like you just lump them all, which is easier, but I like to do them as I go. Uh, the fixed asset turnover ratio measures the number of dollars of sales earned per dollar of fixed asset. So what that means is you take net sales divided by the average book value of the fixed asset. Remember, find, to find the average, hate allergies. You take the beginning of the year, add it to the end of the year of the, of the, of the asset, divided by two, that's the average. So the net sales divided by the average of book value of fixed assets equals the turnover ratio. So for, from here, Starbucks, this is an example, Starbucks increased their asset turnover ratio from 3.55 to 3.56. So they've actually increased their ratio turnover, making a little bit more cash. So this is just basically showing you, are you using the fixed assets you have? So is, is Starbucks, the, uh, those stores that they build and put in, those aren't cheap. But it, here it shows they're making money. They're 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 using their fixed their buildings that they put in that you buy a start a coffee from either through drive through or going in. They're being able to make money off those buildings. They're not just there for no reason. So not bad. And then oh uh, gains and losses. So this amount called the trading allowance may be either greater or less than the book value of all the equipment. So when you sell when you trade equipment. Like let's say you trade in your 2012 Hyundai for 2013, you get a trade-in allowance. The easiest way to account for this is um, put in every entry you know besides the gain or loss, and just use algebra to figure out the gain. Or, use algebra to figure out the gain or loss. So remember, debit accumulated depreciation to take it off. Um, what else is it? Uh, Credit the old equipment, credit the cash, because you always you pay a down payment, and then, let me see, oh, and then the new asset becomes, the new equipment is usually at the fair market, so you put the, the, the new equipment you got, whatever the fair market value is, you put it on as that, and then you're either going to have a gain or a loss on the exchange because you're exchanging an old equipment for a new equipment. And so always take off accumulated depreciation. Always debit, debit accumulated depreciation, debit equipment, the new equipment. Credit the old equipment. Credit cash for the, for the, the down payment you made. And then the difference between the debits and credits is either going to be a gain if it's a credit left over or it's going to be a loss if it's a debt if it's a debit. So just remember that. That was another part. So okay, this was chapter ten. I think this is the last chapter. Yeah, this is the last chapter for two oh one. So I'm um, thank you very much for um uh, hey, uh striking it out with me to the end. And I'm not done yet. Um I'm gonna go over I'm gonna show example videos for all of them. So if you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment. But um, yeah, 201 was a great class. But then we're going to go into 202. So get ready for some fun. It's just a lot of, a lot of stocks, bonds, partnerships. I believe so. Yeah. So thank you very much. And I will see you in the next video. Thank you.